So today we're very lucky to have a very experienced uh, lupus expert to take us through this uh, very complex topic and very interesting topic. Uh, thank you, Professor Ed Vital, for joining us today. Uh, hi, Dr. Ed. Hi. Hi. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, it's great to have you here. I will share a short introduction, very short, because you have so much uh, lupus work that I'm. I mean, I will need a entire an entire webinar on your on your work but briefly i will say that professor vital is an is an associate professor and honorary consultant rheumatologist at the nhr leeds biomedical research center this is a an a loop um, sorry a ular center of excellence in rheumatology research and he established uh, the leeds lupus research group uh, here, and uh, he's a chair of the BSR Special Interest Group for SLE. Uh, that's for the British Society of Rheumatology, for those who are not getting used to the uh, BSR acronym. Also, he's a co-chair of the BSR Working Group that is currently developing, uh, updating the guidelines for the management of lupus. And this will be published uh, next year. Also, he's a member of the ULR 2023 recommendations for SLE working group and chair of the BioLAC, uh, which is a group uh, for the registry of uh, biologics. He's a general secretary for uh, SL Euro. And also he's been involved in uh, the ULAR task force for interferon biomarkers in SLE. Additionally, uh, he's the chair of the Lupus Forum, uh, which is an educational tool that provides up-to-date lupus education to the medical community. It's very interesting that his PhD work was on response to B-cell depletion in rheumatic diseases like lupus and has extensively investigated B-cell uh, mechanisms of uh, death uh, depletion, which take us today to CAR T-cell therapy. Uh, this is really, really good to have you here. And uh, also he has led trials on B cell depletion uh, with different biologics. Um, well, with more than 120 publications, I will just uh, tell you the floor is your, yours. If you anyone has any question during the presentation, please put it in the chat box or um, we're going to have the chance to make questions at the end of the session if you want to speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank thank you for that introduction and thanks for um, inviting me. It's really nice to be speaking to you all. I just I I should say actually, you know that um, people I, I I do a lot of public talks about lupus and scientific meetings and conferences, and people always say to me, "Oh, you, you're speaking all the time. You're really experienced and good at it." But actually, it's always different when you go to a different sort of audience. It's like when I had to speak at my sister's wedding. Actually, I got quite nervous because it's not like talking to scientists. And it, the way we do the talks is different. So I hope this is OK for you. But it's, it's a very different talk to what I normally do. Uh, probably um, different to the wedding one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've used quite a lot of my slides that I use in scientific presentations, but I'm going to just try to take some time to explain what they mean as, as simply as I can, because this is a really complicated subject. So how CAR T works, why we want to do it, what it might mean, you know, what are the key issues? Is, is this going to be a revolution that's going to transform and cure lupus or is it not these these are quite to understand these things you need to know quite a few things about how the immune system works which i'm going to try and explain a bit uh, and to do that we need to go back a bit uh, in history uh, in fact we need to go back a really long way to the middle ages um, so a few weeks ago i was in padua we have a course we do with uh, SLA Euro to try and uh, like a workshop to train lupus experts and, and interact with each other, which we hosted in uh, Andrea Doria, a professor in Padua, hosted it. While we were there, um, as well as talking about lupus, we also got given a tour of this amazing u historic university they have in Padua, uh, like this uh, lecture theatre where they performed uh, dissections and um it was a really amazing tour. And while we were there, 
Professor Doria told me, he said, oh, you'll be interested in this because this university is where this guy worked. Hieronymus Fabricius, or, sorry, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But, um, and he said, you should know about him because what he discovered is something called the bursa of Fabricus, which is in birds. And I did know that. Now, why am I telling you about birds <laughs> in a talk about lupus? So the reason is, is that what the bursa of Fabricus does in birds is it makes B cells. So you probably heard of B cells and T cells in the immune system. So the reason they're called B and T is because where they're made, T cells are made from a gland in the chest called the thymus. B cells in birds are made in a thing called the bursa of Fabricus. That's what B stands for. In humans, we don't have that, but they come from the bone marrow. And conveniently, that also begins with B. So this is why we call them B cells. And I'm, sh I'm sure most people who know a little bit of lupus know that B cells have got something important to do with lupus. And these therapies called CAR T therapies are going to work on trying to do something to B cells. The other thing that I like it, to think about is actually how did we come up with this idea of lupus and why do we even call it lupus systemic lupus erythematosus and this is something else where you can you have to go back to medieval medicine because they used to call something lupus so this medieval physician i'm not even going to try to say his name but he talked about something called lupus vulgaris which is actually a kind of tuberculosis it's an infection in the skin and vulgaris means common so common lupus and we think that the reason lupus which you know means wolf is because it it gnaws at the skin like a bite and that's the idea about where that word comes from and it was much much later when some other physicians discovered that there was another type of lupus that was not due to tuberculosis which he called lupus erythematosus, as in red lupus, um, which looks a bit more like, I think, what we would recognise as being a lupus rash. And it was even, so this wasn't an infection. And it was even later that this doctor, Moritz Kaposi, noticed that some people who had this lupus erythematosus skin rash also had favours and pleurisy. Uh, and arthritis and other problems. And so he called that systemic lupus erythematosus. So that's why we call it this disease. But as you can probably see, in the days before antibiotics, fevers and infections were everywhere. And most people who had some inflammation in their body was due to an infection. And there was a lot of confusion about whether these problems like lupus were due to infections or not, because you can imagine if you, most people have got infections, you've got fevers, it looks a bit like another kind of lupus disease. So, we, and it wasn't really until the post-war era that we understood about autoimmune diseases properly. Like people had an idea about them, but they didn't understand them properly until the post-war era, particularly when we started using antibiotics, but also when scientific methods got better. And a lot of things in rheumatology began in the year 1948. Um, rheumatoid factor was discovered that you get in rheumatoid arthritis. Gold injections for rheumatoid were discovered. Steroid therapy was discovered. It's all about that time. And this, this they also discovered this. This is called LE cells, lupus erythematosus cells. So what this is, this is a sample taken from a patient's bone marrow so you have to have a bone marrow biopsy which is not a very nice thing to have because you have to have a needle put into your bone to take some marrow out of the middle and when they took this bone marrow what they're looking at here these are immune cells which is what lives in the bone marrow but they're eating the nuclei the centers of other of our own cells so in other words this was the first evidence that in these people with lupus the immune system is attacking our own cells. And this is really the piece of evidence that told us that lupus isn't to do with infections, is because the immune system's gone wrong and attacked our own tissues. 
Now, there was a time when you had to have a bone marrow sample in order to get this diagnosis of lupus. Uh, but we don't do that now, obviously. We do it on a blood test. So I imagine some people know, this is Henrietta Lacks. Do, uh, do we know Do we know why she, Why is Henrietta Lacks immortal in the world of SLE testing? It's, it's quite, I, I don't know if everyone knows it. When I present this, some people do, some people don't. But it's quite a famous story. And there's a book about her life. And a film but, too. Sorry. And a, and a movie too. And a movie too. I haven't watched the movie, yeah. <laughs> so Henrietta Lacks didn't have lupus and she wasn't a doctor. She was a patient who had cancer and she died of cervical cancer. But the reason why she's immortal is that they use, they grow the cells from her cancer. Cancer cells grow too much, of course. It's the problem. So that you can keep them alive in the lab. And they're still alive, which is why I say they're immortal, because they're using them in labs around the world. The interesting aspect of the story is that she and her family weren't really asked permission for that to happen, even though um, actually companies are currently making money out of using her cells. Um, but the, Henrietta Lacks's cells is how we test for lupus now. So there's a, we have these cell lines that you can buy, and now I'm going to buy some of these cells and keep growing them in my own lab. And there's one called Hair Lacks cells, Henrietta Lacks, it's from her name, uh, and there's derivatives of them. The one that we commonly use in the lab now is called HEP2, but it's a HEP2 is a derivative of HEP cells. So what happens in the lab now when you have um, uh, a, a blood test for lupus is they take a dish, a Petri dish, on which these cells are growing. They put your serum onto the Petri dish. And if your serum contains antibodies, and I'll explain more about antibodies in a minute, but antibodies that attack these HeLa cells, then they will stick to it and they will glow green. And then you'll know that this person has in their serum some antibodies against the nuclei of other cells, anti-nuclear antibodies. That's what ANA stands for. So this is how we know that B cells have got something to do with lupus. And what's that? So let's talk about antibodies and B cells a bit. <clears throat> so we all had a lot of involvement in antibodies during the pandemic, and they were all over the news, and suddenly every journalist thought they were an expert in them. So antibodies are molecules that recognize other molecules and cells. So there's this Y-shaped thing, and these two ends of the Y is very, very specific for certain other targets. So if you think of the pandemic during COVID, antibodies against COVID-19 did two important things. One is these antibodies are how vaccines work to protect you. So in other words, the vaccine gave you antibodies against COVID so these antibodies could knock out the virus. And the other thing is, is when you've done a lateral flow test, these stripes, these are antibodies. What they've done is they put some antibodies against COVID in a little line on the lateral flow test. And if you add your, your sample out of your throat onto that, then the anti, if you've got, if you and your body are making, so the COVID, sorry, in the sample will stick to the antibodies on the lateral flow test. So antibodies are, your body makes them to fight infections, but we manipulate that function in other ways because they're such useful little molecules that you can use them to make diagnostic tests and you can use them on vaccines. So what B cells do is they make the decision about what antibodies you have in your body. So if you imagine you've got B cells and each each B cell has on its surface an example of the antibody that it knows how to make. So every cell has a slightly different antibody that it's programmed to make, and it puts it on the cell surface. It's a bit like saying that if you wanted to make gloves that could fit every single person possibly in the world, but you couldn't measure everyone's hands to see what size and shape the glove needed to be, and what your body, because you don't, of course, your body hasn't seen all infections, so it can't make the 
can't know what infection is going to meet. There's a bit, if you were trying to do that, if you're aromatic gluts, what you could do is just make millions and millions and millions of them, all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are completely too big, completely too small, you know, wrong shape, whatever. But the ones that, and but the ones that did fit somebody's hand, you to then recognize that and make more and more of those. That's how your body makes these decisions. It makes B cells against everything, and if they don't do anything useful, then that's it they don't that's the end but if the b cell comes along and says oh this is a good fit for this this is a useful antibody that we want then it gets the antigen that whatever it sticks to binds there say it's a covid and then so say you give a vaccine you give a little bit of covid some b cells recognize the antibody and then they get they start proliferating so you get more and more of that b cell because we found out that it's useful and they turn into a, another type of cell called a plasma cell that will make lots and lots of antibodies. That's how a vaccine protects you. A little sample, stimulate the B cells, lots and lots of antibodies. Now, if you get the virus, you've already got lots and lots of antibodies against it in advance before you get ill. Now, the problem with that <clears throat> is that if you're making B cells and antibodies against everything, imaginable then some of them are going to be against yourself how do we stop that happening so there's something your body has this very intricate system to stop that happening called so it's called tolerance and you've got central tolerance which happens in the bone marrow before the b cells got out get out and you've got peripheral tolerance that happens in the blood and well, it's quite complicated, but essentially the idea is, is that as you make B cells, when they're sitting in your bone marrow, be, they haven't come out yet into the blood to serve their purpose. If they're already binding to things before they've come out of the bone marrow, then that's wrong. That means they're auto reactive. They react against yourself. You don't want that. So they get deleted. They either get wiped out or they get made so they can't work allergic it's only if they don't bind to something in your bone marrow that we think they must be then they're not, they're not reacting against you and they might fight infections and then there's something similar in the once they come out into the blood they can again if they still react to your own antigens they can be knocked out so you have this tolerance system stop that happening and b cells have to to do their job they have to you know, they have to agree with a T cell. So I'm not going to go into, it into all that detail, but imagine T cells do a very similar thing. So T cells, they come from this gland called the thymus that's in the middle of the chest. They do it, they're selected in exactly the same way. You get T cells against everything and you delete the ones that react against your own body. And it's only when both the B cell and the T cell agree, they both recognize the same antigen that they can talk to each other. And that's when you get an immune response. So if you imagine the way that would work, say you've got a vaccine, it's injected into your arm, some cells into your arm muscle, take little bits of that vaccine, they go up to one of your lymph nodes, like in your neck or under your arms, they find a B cell and they find a T cell and they show it to them. And if you find a B cell that says, yes, I recognize that, and a T cell that also says, yes, I recognize that. And the B cell and the T cell talk to each other and they help each other and they proliferate and you get immunity against it. And that, that's what is shown on here, actually. So first, if you've never seen the antigen before, you wouldn't get much. But once you've, once you've had a vaccine, you'll get a memory of a response to that in your B cells and in your T cells. Um, the other thing that you can really see antibodies working in lupus is on something like this. This is a skin biopsy. Here's the epidermis, the top layer of skin. Here's the dermis, the bottom layer of skin. And in between the two, you've got this bright glowing green line. And it's just like the ANA test I showed you in the lab. But this is in the skin. The antibodies in the skin are sticking into the skin. And causing inflammation so b cells make antibodies antibodies go into the skin the skins now then that could cause a rash basically. so 
we're pretty sure that B cells have got something really important to do with lupus. So that led to the idea that maybe we should get rid of them. And it sounds like quite a radical thing to do and quite a scary thing to do, but actually it works and it's safe. So how do we get rid of them? Well, as you've realized, we use antibodies for everything. Antibodies are causing the disease, but we can also use antibodies to cure the disease. And what we have to do here is make antibodies that do what we want. They make a thing called monoclonal antibodies, because normally if you've got a, an infection, you'd get lots of different antibodies that all targeted the same cell. And we call that polyclonal. Clone means like lots of them all the same, and you've got lots of clones of them. That's what would happen with an infection. Now, when, when we want to do, when we want to make antibodies for what we want, we want them to be a bit purer than that. And we, in, we create something called monoclonal antibodies. They're all exactly the same so that we has predictable effects. And we do this basically by getting a mouse to make them for us. <laughs> so we get the, the mouse gets stimulated with the antigen and then you take single cells from the mouse and grow them up so they're all exactly the same. The problem there is that you can't give mouse antibodies to a human. You can't, in fact, you don't want any part of a mouse injected into you. Um, and so what we have to do is make something called a chimeric antibody. Chimera is this Greek thing that had different parts of different animals, like a lion and a goat, and then maybe the tail of a snake or something. Um, and so chimeric is when we combine two different animals together. So if you imagine we've made this antibody in a mouse, but we can't give that to a human because it would just be recognized as foreign and your body would kick it out. Um, and what they do instead is they combine the bits of the mouse antibody that are recognizing what you want and combine it with the back end of a human antibody. So it's like the two species together. And that's what can be used as a drug. And in reality, this is all done in, in the, 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 the mouse part just happens at the very beginning. They're not involved in making the actual medicines. The medicines you receive have got nothing to do with mice. They're just made in a lab. But that's just how they how it how it's invented in the first place. OK. So actually, not a lot of people know this, not a lot of doctors know this, but actually, when you look at the names of these drugs, it tells you all about that story. So these are two drugs used to treat lupus. One's called rituximab and one's called belimumab. So the names, if you start from the back, MAB means monoclonal antibody. They both end in MAB. In fact, most of these drugs end in MAB. The bit before that tells you xi chi it's like the greek letter chi because it's chimeric it means it's part mouse part human molecule if it says mu it means it's more it's all human like belimumab the bit before that tells you what organ what part of the body it's meant to work on this there's, there's a bit funny these li means lymphocyte you know like the immune system lymphocytes TU actually means tumour, as in it's for cancer. And the reason is that rituximab was first invented as a treatment for cancer. That's why it's got TU in it. The bit at the front is they just make it up. So rituximab works on tumours, chimeric, monoclonal antibody. Belimumab works on the immune system, humanised, monoclonal antibody. I can't really wait to surprise my consultant with that knowledge. To yes, yeah. there you go. Not a lot of people know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what these drugs do is they target things on the so cells have lots of different molecules on the surface, and we give them these numbers to code for them. They all do different important things for the cell, but we give them these names called CD names. And B cells have two we're going to think about. One's called CD19 and one's called CD20. So if it's got CD20 on, it's a B cell. If it's got CD19 on, it's a B cell. We want to get rid of B cells. So we make a drug 
that target CD20, and that's what rituximab is. So rituximab is a drug that gets rid of B cells, and it was originally invented for cancers that involve B cells called lymphomas. But this study was done in 2002. I can't believe it's more than 20 years ago, because I remember this. But this study that was done in 2002 was by David Eisenberg um, and also Joe Edwards, who had the idea um, in, um, and so all the authors you see there, in, in UCL in London. And what they did was they tried giving this drug, rituximab, to people who had lupus to kill all their B cells. And they found that it worked. So what rituximab does is it targets B cells in a special way. B cells start in your bone marrow as these like immature kinds of cells that gradually develop. So we call them stem cells, pro B cells, pre B cells. Then they come out in the blood. And like I say, they float about in the blood that each one's programmed for something. It could be COVID, it could be flu, it could be one of your own tissues if, you, if, it, if they've gone wrong. They float about looking for that antigen, the thing they react to. If they don't find it, nothing else happens. That's the end of the story for that B cell. If they do find it, they get activated. They go to a lymph node. They talk to a T cell, see if they agree. If they agree, they turn into memory B cells. And then they turn into those things I said called plasma cells that make antibodies. And what rituximab does is clever about it is because it targets CD20, these ones don't have CD20, so they're left alone. And these ones don't have CD20 either. So what that means is it's, it's the decision-making bit in the middle that gets taken out. But because your stem cells are okay, your B cells will come back again. You have a one treatment of the rituximab, the B cells die. But once the rituximab leaves your blood after a few weeks, the B cells can start to come back. So you, they, you, you, they always come back. And the other thing is these plasma cells, so if you're already immune to measles and mumps and flu and COVID, those plasma cells survive as well. So you retain that immunity. And that's why it's safe to do. It's just a temporary, it's like a reset. It's a temporary reset of the system. And this is what David Eisenberg and his colleagues found in that first paper. This is BILAG. This is how active the lupus is. And these six patients who had this treatment, their lupus got better. So now this is where I started doing my PhD. Because I must tell you that at that time, the hype about rituximab was a bit about like the hype is about CAR T cells. So we all thought, this is amazing. This is, you can deplete, you can deplete the B cells, they come back again, it's reset the computer, the mistake is gone, the lupus will be cured. And we were set, we, and we noticed people having amazing responses. But not everyone responded. For okay, some and patients, that was, sorry, that was 20 years ago already. Uh, I started my pitch in like 2006, something like that. So it's a few years after that first paper. Uh, so uh, what I did was I noticed something, which is that some people got better very well, some people it didn't work. And some people it worked, but not for very long. And what I noticed was when you do this, you've got these cells called plasma blasts, which is like blast means an immature version of something. So it bl plasma blast, I know it sounds like a computer game or something, but what it actually means is like an immature version of a plasma cell. So um, what you know, I noticed is that after you give rituximab, you see lots of these going around in the blood on their own. And if you've got these, these are only meant to live for a few days. So like, you know, months after rituximab was given, you've just got these going around. And what that means is they must be, because they only live a few days, they must be coming from somewhere else. So their their traffic between your lymph nodes, your glands in your neck and under your arm, and your bone marrow. And so in other words, even though it looked like all the B cells had gone, actually, when you go into the tissues, they're still in hiding, hiding away and still active. This was the big finding I made that 
this is what it looked like when you do it in a lab. We use this method called flow cytometry and you've got the naive B cells, the new ones, the memory ones that have responded and these plasma blasts. And after you give rituximab, you just see these plasma blasts, small numbers of them are on their own, but those small numbers mean that there's B cells still active in other tissues. And what we found was that if you've got these surviving, then the lupus doesn't get better. This is like a lupus blood test called double-stranded DNA, which you'll have all the time for lupus. So here it is, it didn't fall if those cells were still around because they're still B cells active. Whereas if they were gone completely, then it got better. People got better. So we found that the rituximab doesn't kill the B cells efficiently enough. And if you did kill them efficiently enough, it was better because you, those ones that survive might be really important. They might be the exact baddies that you want to get rid of. We now know, uh, I'll just, I won't spend long on this, but we now know, this is a much, much more recent piece of work that we did, that we found out that there's, there's a genetic component to why um, some people, the same drug kills all their B cells really efficiently, and in other people who have the same drug, it doesn't, because this, there's a, a gene that's involved in this part varies from person to person. That's why. So we found out that killing B cells can be quite a good and useful thing, and it can make lupus tremendously better and be really effective, but it doesn't kill them all completely. There was something else I noticed in my PhD. It's always amazing that the things I noticed in my PhD are the things I'm still thinking about today. Um, the other thing I noticed was in some people, what the, this graph is called a survival plot. Survival in this, when, when we say survival in statistics, we don't mean survival like being alive, survival. What we mean is survival without something happening. So it could, so it's survival like without a relapse. If you have a relapse, you've not survived the relapse-free thing. You're, you're, you know, it could just be a flare in your joints or something. But So what this shows is if you imagine these people have responded to treatment, 100% means 100% of people are still responding. They're still doing well. As time goes on, it stops working. And eventually, if you get down to zero, it means everyone's had a relapse. Everyone's cut their lupus back again. So after we gave the rituximab, it, although it made people better, it didn't, it, the disease did come back. You've got some people who it came back as soon as the B cells came back. First sort of six, nine, 12 months. Other people had really long responses. So look at this, how long this is. This is a year, this is many years. There were some people who were having remission for many years after rituximab, but in the end, even they did relapse in the end. So although the rituximab worked, resetting the computer like that didn't do what we hoped. It didn't actually cure the lupus. It made people better. And sometimes it made them better for years. But in the end, the lupus came back again. And the question was asked, is, is this because these B cells that were hiding away were remembering the disease? So to summarize all of that so far, about halfway through, I guess, I've been on for time. Um, Antibodies are these molecules that exactly fit other molecules and cells like a lock and a key. And where they're involved, the reason we have antibodies is to fight infections. And B cells, which have to agree with T cells, decide what antibodies get made in your body. You can get antibodies because you have an infection, but you can also stimulate them with a vaccine to mimic the infection before you get it. And we can also make antibodies in the lab, which we can use to make tests like lateral flow tests and all the things we do with our research, and also to make drugs like rituximab, which is an antibody against B cells, which B cells make antibodies. So. And in lupus, B cells seem to be malfunctioning and making antibodies against our own cells, those ANA antibodies that you test for on the, on the HELA cells. And B cells have these markers on their surface called CD19 and CD20. So we made an antibody in a lab that would target CD20. So the antibody would kill the B cells and the B cells were making the bad antibodies. So rituximab could be effective for lupus, but it didn't always 
deplete B cells deeply enough in all the patients, especially the ones that were hiding in the tissue. And even when it did work and worked beautifully well, when B cells came back, people relapsed. So the lupus wasn't completely eliminated. It was this, so this is something where you really learned how things work from the clinic. I remember these patients vividly, these people who were say they were they were saying like, oh, it's brilliant, I've come off all my treatment, I've forgotten I've got lupus, you know, two years later, three years later. And we were watching very closely. And it, very sadly it started to come back. But I mean the Good thing is, is, although it did come back, we knew how to treat it when the second time. So this brings us on to what we're talking about today, which is CAR T cells. So CAR T cells were invented, again, just like rituximab, this came about because of cancer. So there's a, you may, there's a type of cancer called lymphoma, and lymphoma is a cancer of your B cells, and that's what rituximab was designed to get rid of. Now you can imagine that if it's cancer, you really want to make sure every single cell is gone. If one survives, it can come back. And so they had exactly the same problem that we had, which is that how do we kill the B cells better to get rid of them all? And they tried lots and lots of different things. But one of the things they tried is this. Again, it's trying to use your immune system against, your against itself. So T cells, part of your own immune system, they decide what they're going to attack, just like a B cell. They can all make a decision. They can attack this or that. They can be trained. They can be programmed. And what they did was they made, they took the receptor of the T cell, which could be against flu or could be against COVID or measles or something, and they've changed it. They reprogrammed it to be against what they wanted, like CD19 or CD20. So you're get, taking your own T cell that's meant to attack an infection. You're saying, right, let's reprogram that and put a receptor on it that targets CD19 or CD20. So then this T cell will go around killing B cells. And T like everything, you can't make anything in a lab that's effective as your own body. So the, the immune system's ability to hone in and kill a cell, like the T cells do, is better than anything we can make. So how this works, and this is this slide, it says cancer therapy because it was developed to treat cancer, but it's the same thing that's been used to treat lupus that we've all been talking about. So if you're going to have this treatment, what would happen? First of all, you'd go into hospital and be attached to this machine that's a bit like a kidney dialysis machine. So it filters through your blood. And what it does is it filters your blood to take out the white cells, including those T cells. It's called leukapheresis. So essentially we collect lots and lots of your white blood cells that include all those T cells. The rest of your blood goes back into your body. Then you go away for a few weeks whilst somebody, some clever person in a lab does this reprogramming. So they take your T cells, they sort them out to get pure populations of T cells, and then they put in a different gene into the T cells so that the T cells are now programmed against CD19. CD19 being a, a something that, that, you know, the signature of a B cell. So once you've made, it could be other things, it's CD19 for the our purposes, but you could you could do other things. So you made these T cells, then the, you now, once they're ready, the patient has to come back in, and they grow lots and lots of them. Now, if you're the patient, you have to come back into hospital. This is a bit complicated because if they just gave you those T cells, they wouldn't last very long because you've got so many others and your immune system's all active and they, they wouldn't be around very long. So before you have them, they have to give you some chemotherapy like chemotherapy for cancer. So there's a drug called cyclophosphamide, which we also use for lupus and it's used for cancer. And there's a drug called fludarabine, which is used for cancer, but we don't use it for lupus. And you have to have both. Then, so that gets rid of lots of your own T cells to like make space for these. Then these CAR T cells are given back to you. At that point, it can cause a bit of a reaction. So, uh, lots of these infusions can cause reactions, but some of them can be quite bad with this. So you can get a kind of 
cytokine storm, like where you get lots of fever and inflammation, and sometimes it can cause some neurological symptoms. Fortunately, all of that could be managed and it's quite short lasting, but you can feel a little bit ill at that point. And then you go home. And these T cells will live in the blood for a few weeks or a few months, and they will go around killing B cells, just like the rituximab did, but they're better at it. We know they go deeper into tissues and kill more of them. And that's why it was licensed for cancer, because we could, if there was a cancer that couldn't be fully eliminated by rituximab, it could be more fully eliminated if you did CAR T cells instead. So all where this comes into lupus is this paper that was published in Nature Medicine in 2022. It was by the group of Georg Schett um, in Germany. And what he did was he took this exact same treatment. This, this is their diagram from their paper, but it's exactly what I just told you. Leukapheresis, make the product, conditioning therapy, give the T cells, and then watch. And this is, again, this is what it looks like when the CAR T cells appear in the blood. Here it is without them, here's with them for that patient. So five patients, each one got given these CAR T cells. There they are. When they were given, this is the B cells. The B cells disappeared, just like what rituximab does. They all disappeared. And, uh, well, this bit's not too important. But what they said was that these five patients who'd all had quite bad and difficult lupus all responded. And they've been following them to see how long it will last. So the, the CAR T cells are around for a while, but B cells start coming back after a few months. But these people still seem to be well. Now, we're about 18 months in, I think. On the whole, there is a bit different because some people had it earlier than others. But we're about 18 months in. And what they say is these patients have come off all their other lupus therapy and are in complete remission and they're off steroids. And that's why the excitement that if you depleted deeper, can you really forget and undo the mistake? And more, if you're resetting a computer, this is re not just turning it off and on, this is factory settings. And that will really, and so that's the excitement. Um, now I'm going to before I'm going to tell you a little bit why I'm not sure. I, I I hope that's true, but there are some reasons why it might not be as true as that. But I'll tell you about that, in a, which I'll go on to tell you about now. The other thing you might be wondering, I just thought at this point, I keep telling you how we tried to kill all the B cells. And also that the B cells are there to fight infections. And I have this conversation in clinic all the time where I say, I'm going to give you this treatment and it's going to kill all your B cells. Patients usually say to me, don't I have those for a reason? <laughs> and is that really safe? And actually, I told you why I think it's safe, okay, at the beginning, because it doesn't kill them all and you leave the stem cell behind and you leave your plasma cell behind. But actually... Look at this from practice. This is a trial that was done with rituximab a long time ago. Uh, people with active lupus, and some got rituximab, some got placebo. And when we look at these trials, what we usually look at is serious. You, everyone gets adverse events, coughs, colds, you know, cut yourself, whatever. It's all called an adverse event if something happens to you when you're in a trial. And usually almost everyone in a trial has had an adverse event. What's often more interesting is serious adverse events. Serious adverse event means you had to go into hospital for it, usually, at least, or worse. So look at serious infections. This would mean something like getting pneumonia and having to spend a week in hospital would be a serious infection. Placebo, 15 out of 88 people got a serious infection, which is 17%. Rituximab, 16 out of 169 got a serious infection, which is 9.5%. So in other words, you were twice as likely to get a serious infection if you'd had placebo than if you'd had rituximab. Um, so when you take these drugs, people often say, this might increase your risk of infection. Well, that's not what occurred here. I'd rather be here. And the, initially that might seem strange. Why would that be? But actually, when you think about it, it does make sense, because if you haven't had any the right treatment, you're ill with lupus. 
these people are happy and well and they're going around leading a normal life. These people are ill and these people are taking more steroids than these people because their lupus is active. So having bad lupus and having steroids is worse than having rituximab. So actually, when people are, I, I'm not saying there is absolutely nothing to worry about because it could be that if you have rituximab and no B cells, then when you get an infection, you might, there are only certain types of infection that are more of a problem. So I'm not saying there's absolutely nothing to worry about, but I do also say that you, you know, most of the time you're better off without your B cells than with them. And this, this is with another like, drug that I'll tell oh, yeah. you about. Sorry, Sorry, to clarify, when you said placebo, there, the, these patients were is still receiving treatment, right? Yeah, Stop. the way we do these trials. Right. Yeah, so imagine your background treatment, your normal treatment was azathioprine and prednisolone. Then you're still having that and an infusion of placebo, or you're having your same thing, azathioprine and the active drug. That's the, how they normally do them. There are different ways. Obviously, when you do these trials, you can't give people nothing. So there are various ways to handle that problem a bit too complicated to talk about now but there are ways we do it this is another trial of a drug called abinutuzumab abinutuzumab is like next generation rituximab even better than rituximab and it, you saw exactly the same thing look serious infections five out of 64 people that's eight percent placebo 11 out of 61 people that's 18 percent it's half so actually you know Depleting your B cells might sound quite radical and you think that's what, a, what an extreme thing to do, but actually the safety is very good. And remember, it's only a temporary depletion. They come back. So now I'm going to tell... Uh, at ACR, we were debating this a lot. Is, it have, is this the cure? Is depleting B cells completely with CAR T cells going to cure lupus? Well, maybe. It may, and may, maybe it will be, maybe it won't be. Most likely it could be for some people and it might not be for others. But I'll tell you why I have a little bit of skips, even though I'm the person who said in the first place, you need to deplete B cells all those years, whatever it was, 18 years ago. Or, or even though I was the one who said you have to deplete B cells deeper, I have some skepticism. So as I say, they've said to you that these Five patients. Now, there's, I think in the whole world, there's about 15 people published and they didn't all have lupus. Some had other diseases. So we're talking about small amounts of evidence. But these five people have all responded well. They've all been in remission for about 18 months without other lupus therapies. That sounds great. But that's also what David Eisenberg said in 2002. OK, so you need a bit more evidence than that. It's great. It's an advance. The idea was that if you go deeper, you'll eliminate the disease completely and that will be a cure. The B cells start to come back after a few months, but people remained well, which does suggest that this is like a resetting computer, that you've, 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 the computer's gone wrong, you've turned it off, you've turned it back on, and made it back to normal. But all of this is based on a certain theory about lupus. And the theory of the the theory of lupus that we're assuming here is that the reason why the B cells went wrong in the first place was an accident. It was a mistake. It just it happened one day. Perhaps you had an infection that turned on lots of your B cells, and one of them kind of accidentally got auto reactive. But you know, I told you that B cells will grow and survive if they can see the thing they react against, and obviously that's always there in your own body, and that's why the, the mistake couldn't be forgotten. That's the theory here, is that once one cell had gone wrong and reacted against yourself, that cell could kept growing and growing and growing. You could, and that's why lupus is chronic. That's the theory. And therefore, if you reset them, the mistake wouldn't be made again, unless you were very, very unlucky, because lupus is really rare. Right? So, um, well, not really rare, but it's uncommon. Okay? So it shouldn't happen again, unless you were extraordinarily unlucky. Is that correct? Is that theory about why we get lupus correct? I'm not sure it is. And I'll tell you why I'm not sure that that is correct. Go back to my PhD. I told you that some people, they, they relapsed early. Some people relapsed later. 
some of them are very long responses, some of them are short responses. What was happening in these two groups of people was that B cells, it wasn't that the B cells all came back, but sometimes you got good B cells back and sometimes you got bad B cells back, but the number was the same, which is what you might think. What's actually happening is the B cells were just taking a lot longer to come back, which would suggest it's not really that they've been corrected and reformed. It's just that they're still not there. But there's something else I saw while I was doing my PhD that, uh, in fact, this is the patient that made me do research in lupus, because I, I was also working on rheumatoid, but this is where I sort of said, this is more interesting. This lady, and she's she's very active in lupus charities, and she's, you know, she's really happy for this to be to be used to explain things. And I'm very grateful because I've used this Slayer very safe slide to explain this to doctors. This lady had was one of the first people to have rituximab in Leeds and she was having it because her platelet count was very low so in her blood platelets should be over like there should be hundreds of platelets she only had five of them which means she's at high risk of severe bleeding all the treatments have been tried we didn't know what to do we said here's this new drug called rituximab have it and her platelet count came up to a normal healthy level wonderful great we 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 probably saved her life but before she had that treatment she didn't have skin lupus she never had it it appeared when she had no b-cells and we did a biopsy to prove it and this is exactly definite skin lupus so in other words there's some parts of her lupus that were something to do with b-cells but there were some other aspects of her lupus that weren't to do with b-cells and I thought, how could, I don't understand that. Now I know the answer to this question. And it's to do because of one of my own PhD students called Anthony Saras, who's he's a very good lupus researcher too. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about him in future. He works in Oxford now. But we worked on a, something completely different, which is called interferons. So again, this is a slide I use for scientists, and I know it looks complicated, but actually what it's trying to say is really simple. Think of what are the genes that give you lupus? There's more than 100 of them. That's probably more than 200 of them. Uh, and you probably, if you've got a few of the bad ones together, you get lupus. If you haven't got enough of them, you'd, a bit like a card of ha a hand of cards, you know, you have to have all the right cards at the same time for it to mean something. Some of these genes are something to do with B cells and T cells, which is this brown circle like we were just talking about. Some of these genes are something to do with antibodies, like we were just talking about. But some of these genes are nothing to do with that. They're to do with a molecule called interferon. Interferon is something to do with viruses, and it's a completely different part of your immune system. There's nothing to do with B cells and T cells, really. We call it interferon because they noticed that one virus could interfere with another virus. These genes are the ones that are the strongest at giving you lupus. So there are some of these genes that even just one of them will result in causing lupus rather than needing lots and lots of them. So interferons are very different to everything I've been telling you. Interferons are to do with viral infections. Every single cell in the body can make interferons and every single cell in the body can respond to interferons, not just blood immune cells. Like if you had, say, hepatitis B, a virus in your liver, then your liver cells would make interferons because they would say, I've got a virus inside me. And the, the interferons do lots of things to every single cell. So they would tell other liver cells, oh, there's danger about, you know, turn on your defences um, and stop the virus from replicating. They also stimulate the immune cells in your blood. So they do lots and lots of things. And we know that's something to do with lupus because of the genetics. So then we ask, where's the interferon coming from in people with lupus? People used to think, that the interferon was coming from some cells in the blood, these ones called PDCs, um, 
we found out this is a, a test for interferon production by PDC. So healthy people, you get some cells like that that making interferons. We found out that lupus patients don't have that. They have less. The blood cells don't make interferons at all. Um, we, what we found instead is that when we looked in biopsies of the skin, like that biopsy shows you the earlier, the skin is making the interferon. This really changed my opinion of lupus because I used to think, and we also showed that this happens before you get lupus. So it could be years before you get lupus. So I used to think, okay, lupus is a disease where your immune cells in your blood are attacking healthy tissues. But this made me think, no, that's not the full story because this isn't the immune system attacking healthy, normal skin. This is the immune system attacking skin that's going, danger, danger, come and attack me. That's what the skin is doing here, making interferon. The skin is saying there is something wrong before it gets attacked. And so the, the, there's more to this story than just the immune system attacking normal tissues, the tissues themselves. It's a bit like if you were sitting at home in the evening, like I am now, and the police suddenly burst in and started smashing everything up, you'd say, stupid police, why are you doing that? I'm minding my own business. You should leave me alone. I'm a good citizen. That's how we used to think of lupus. But if I was sitting here with my burglar alarm ringing and the police burst in the window, you might not be so surprised. And that's the difference in these two points of view. Did the police go mad and make a mistake and attack someone normal? Or was it my fault <laughs> because I reported a crime and they were just responding to it and doing their job? And that's essentially the two different sort of theories to balance here. If it's the first one, then CAR T cells, depleting B cells, correcting the police is the right thing to do. But if it's the second one, the police are just going to come and they could do it again because there was, there was more to the story. And so what me and Anthony did, we spent lots of long nights talking about this theory and we ended up reading lots and lots of papers because we'd studied the skin, but actually a lot, all the different tissues in the body that can be affected by lupus, like the kidneys, this is bigger, the, the brain, the joints, they, they can all make interferons too. So maybe what happens in lupus is you've got this two-way thing hematopoietic immunity, meaning blood, like B cells that have gone wrong, attacking healthy tissues. But on the other side, you've got the tissues themselves saying, come and attack me. And if you think about it that way, maybe this two sides to this story could explain lots of things that we never understood about lupus. But why is it that this person's got a rash, this person's got arthritis, and this person's got kidney lupus, when their blood all seems to be the same. Maybe it's not the blood making that decision. Maybe the tissues, there's something about the tissues in that person. And why is it that when we give these very effective drugs that target cells in the blood, like B cells, that some people still relapse? Well, maybe it's because the disease the memory of the disease isn't B cells hiding away. It's the tissues themselves. And those tissues won't be affected by these drugs at all. They'll still do it before, they'll still do it after. In other words, I started to say, it's like it's in the soil. So I've, I'm, try I'm giving you two sides of an argument here, um, but the argument against CAR T as a cure, as a cure, mind you, that doesn't mean it won't work and it might work extremely well, but whether it will be, it may certainly deplete B cells and it may give you a good clinical response, but B cells probably don't become abnormal by accident. They probably do it for a reason because of some other genes in the body or other parts of the immune system. They probably, it wasn't a one-off mistake. It were probably other reasons and those parts of the immune system wouldn't be affected by the CAR-T therapy, which would suggest that in the end, the lupus will return. Of course, then, I mean, we don't know who's right. No one knows. It's too early in the day. 
But of course, then the question is, is how long will that take? What if it is five years? And if it was five years, would you say it was worth it? This is this is, all, this is a question actually for patients and families rather than doctors, maybe, to say how long, what, what would be worth it? If it was cure, would it be worth it? Probably yes. If it was five years, would it be worth it? If it was two years, you, know, you have to, that's, and that's what we need to know. The other thing, though, to remember that's happening at the same time, you know, I mentioned this drug called abinutuzumab. This is the next generation of rituximab. There's a few of these. So these aren't CAR T therapies. They're just, in fact, it's just a self-injection. So you just do it yourself at home, even some of them. And these can be better than rituximab. So at the same time as developing CAR Ts to go deeper with B cells, there may actually be other drugs that do the same job without needing such a complicated procedure. Okay, I'll just finish with one thing. So I hope I've tried to give a balanced idea that this is where the excitement is, but also the things we need to think about. But yes. everything, everything I've told you is about CD19 and CAR-T. That these CAR-Ts are programmed against CD19 and they're designed to kill B cells. And that's what we've published about so far. But the things that people are thinking there is a massive investment in industry and academia about this they are thinking of many other clever ways because a car t could be programmed to do lots and lots of things anything you want and they're thinking of other ways they could target not all b cells but only the b cells that are causing the problem for example or they could be designed to sort of retrain the immune system and make it more tolerant so then when you say CAR T, CD19 CAR T is killing B cells, but other types of CAR T could be doing other jobs. And this is going to be fast moving. And I think you're going to see massive amounts of data published in the next few years. So thank you for listening to me. Thanks for your attention. I hope it's been uh, helpful and I'm happy to take any questions at all. And tr I'll try my best. All right. Thank you, Ed. Well, first, I should say that we all now want to read your PhD. I mean, we, want to <laughs> <fit. laughs> we are so intrigued. I wanted to learn more about it. So I think it's been wonderful. I think everyone agrees that it's been wonderful. So much interesting knowledge. I mean, of our own disease, about our lupus that we wouldn't find in any other way. So thank you very much for that. It wasn't only CAR-T, but also, you know, the general knowledge to understand and using something that is so familiar to us, like COVID and vaccines. So thank you for that. Yeah. We have questions. Wonderful presentation. As uh, yeah, you can you have all the. I'm going to read all the comments in the in the chat box. A wonderful presentation. Thank you for giving a clear picture of the situation and um, interesting and very informative uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I think that says everything. Um, yes, great presentation. So we're going to go to the questions. But uh, Amy, would you like to read the questions from the chat box, or I could go first with the ones we have here uh you go for it all right so you're, you're doing it you're doing a great job <laughs> <laughs> thank you um Ed, what we'll do uh because we want to answer as many questions as possible so you'll have to try to answer these difficult questions you know as yeah, well, high, yeah. at high speed so first uh with this um you mentioned uh, interferon type 1 and uh, uh, B cell depletion. You have worked with both uh, both treatments uh, in practice. So you have seen patients, lupus patients, using and having these treatments. In your experience, in, in from your point of view, after giving these treatments to patients, do you see a difference in their lupus that you could say, well, interferon or B cell? What, what, I mean, what, what do you see? Which is the right after? drug or which drug does which thing, you mean? Yes. This, everyone wants to know this, and honestly, we're still learning it because when you when they do the trials, they just test the drug against placebo, not against each other. So we're still learning it, but there are some things that we think we've seen probably at the moment, if it's kidney lupus, targeting B cells is better, I think. Antibodies have a very important role there, and beasts have a very important role. That doesn't mean that targeting interferon won't work at all, but we have more evidence. Whereas if you have skin lupus, it seems to me that targeting interferon is more effective. I mean, we have saw some people who had tried, they had really bad skin, and they tried everything, ev and I mean everything, um, uh, you know, and I'd given them 15 different drugs for their lupus. And when we got 
interfere on targeting i said as a lady i know who i said to her you know ah oh, this drug's different it'll be different and she says you always say that <laughs> but um it was it completely you know, so it that's what convinces me that they can there are some types of lupus that are something to do with b cells or something else and but I, where we're learning was you know it's, it, it, for, if someone tells you they know it's it, I, I don't think we do yet we're still learning that all right that, that's really good too because we patients have to make decisions to with you consultants obviously and this is yeah. important to know. so for uh this group who received car t cells uh, therapy uh could anyone receive this therapy in the future or do you think this will be for a specific group of people only based on the information you have now I think that, I mean, I think that, again, of course we're learning, um, but I think some of the, firstly, you'd say it'd be, you'd probably think you'd have to have quite severe lupus, because that's quite a big thing to go through. It's also worth mentioning that at the moment, the cost is about 200,000 euros to do this. I mean, things come down when they get more popular use, but it, it will never be cheap when you think of everything you have to do. So you know, hospital admissions, chemotherapy, drugs, potential reactions, you know, these are things that you are going to, it'll, you'll need to have quite bad lupus to justify, probably likely people who've tried off treatments already. So it's probably at the more severe and the more resistant end, at least initially. Um, and again, like I say, there, I told you that I thought targeting B cells was really good for kidney lupus, but maybe not as good i mean it can work but maybe not my first choice drug for skin lupus then there are things like that so it's probably the same sorts of people who you'd use rituximab bilimumab or binutuzumab the b-cell drugs we have now i imagine that that gives you a clue as to who would do best with car t-cells yeah all right, that's good to hear. Now, you mentioned different targets, even, I mean, in the B cells, it's not just one. At the moment, with CAR T uh, therapy, are they using, I mean, it's the same one for everyone, or do you have different kinds of CAR T? Um, there right. are. So the, the technologies are very complex, and there are, there are lots and lots of companies trying to make CAR T cells. They all have slightly different approaches in how they do it so like i say most of these they're trying to kill b cells but there are slight differences in how they do it not all of that is public you know at the moment because these are you know things in development that are you know commercial products um, but there are differences there are some interest some of the interesting aspects of whether you can make it safer and easier make a more simple procedure could you save some of the car t cells so that if your lupus does come back you don't have to do it all over again You've still got them saved and frozen. Um, and like I say, some of them aren't. And there are some of these technologies that aren't targeting B cells at all. They're doing something totally different. So, yeah, all right, it, that's it's, it's, you know, what yeah. we've seen so far in the literature is only tip of the iceberg. Yes. No. So when we hear CAR T, we know that it's not. It could be. I mean, different approaches. Car, just, yeah, CAR T yeah. means you've programmed a T cell to do something for you which doesn't have to be killing a B cell, yeah. All right, I guess this question uh, will be related with when it's using cancer. I mean, this therapy could be used multiple times in, in your la I mean, in your lifetime, or it, it's just one-off therapy. I, I think you wouldn't be doing it very often okay. because, you know, it's complex and it's designed to last a long time. And if it's not lasting a long time, it's probably not really doing what you wanted especially if you have to have some chemotherapy drugs every time but i understand i haven't met the patients who had it but uh george shet tells me that some of the patients said if my response was so good that if it did flare up after a few years i'd do it again so this is this is the equation that we need to work out is how how good a response does it need to be i think most people would say if it was cure me it was going to cure me it'd be worth it but if it was going to last this long or that long or be this good a remission or that good a remission what what level does it what does it need to show all right thank you very much uh do you know uh people with lupus we have multiple autoimmune conditions is there any information about using this therapy 
in pa uh, lupus patients and solving other autoimmune conditions. I, I had exactly the same idea. Yeah, I had exactly <laughs> the same thought. But if you that would be the perfect situation, wouldn't it? But you could have lots of diseases all caused by B cells. Yeah, yeah. It would make complete sense. I don't think that's been done yet because it's too early. But it, yeah, absolutely, that would make sense but to me. This means that we're having a webinar too with you in the future <laughs> for answering yeah. the question that you don't answer today. Yeah, so and you'll find out who's right and wrong. Yes, exactly. It will be very, very interesting. So I'll let I'll, I'll leave uh, Amy to read the questions from the chat box and from Facebook. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. I will start with um, the chat. They're coming in hard and fast, actually. Uh, we'll have to kind of zoom through. Uh, somebody was asking about um, cyclophosphamide. Would you have the same amount as the lupus protocol, or would it be a higher dose for CAR T cell therapy? Uh the doses can vary. Um, the dose in the CAR-T is it's higher than what most people get for their lupus, but you don't have it for as long. Okay. Because normally if you have a lupus, you have it every few weeks for like a few months. And yeah. the, this is just a much shorter treatment. Sort of a one-shot situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody else has asked, has, uh, oh, it was early on in your presentation about the resting, the plasma. Does that have anything to do with the fatigue that is caused in lupus? Is there a connection there that's been studied at all? Yeah, I mean, exactly why you get fatigue in lupus, it we don't fully know. Um, we don't, and we wish we did. Um, some fatigue I've seen, you know, when we use drugs that target B cells and things, so they will definitely get better with that treatment and that's what they say about the patients here who had the CAR-T therapy too some people it doesn't actually some people you know I see all the arthritis goes all the rash goes but actually they still feel tired and so maybe you know like for example the some of the things that don't get affected by those treatments like the interferon production could be the other thing that can happen especially when you've had lupus for a long time when you've had lupus for a long time it's not all about active disease anymore. You've started to get long-term complications. Like, for example, if you've taken steroids for a long time, that can cause complications. It can change hormone levels and things like that. That can make you feel fatigued. Yeah. Or, you know, you, you just the way it affects your whole happen. life. You know, it affects yeah. everything in your life. Um, and life can be harder. You know, which And some of these things can't be solved with medicines. You know, so... Uh, that's why it's a complicated question to answer but Definitely. i suppose the positive thing is we do know that in many people the right treatment if you can reverse what's wrong you can improve fatigue that's good to know thank you um this is actually a question that i wanted to ask <laughs> as seeing as i'm leading this um mm. i was wondering when you were talking about your sort of skepticism about car t cells um, and the kind of cause of lupus do you think it could actually help as a sort of added uh, element to help identify ultimately help to identify the true cause of lupus yeah that's really that the good treatment. point yeah the, and it's quite similar to a bit of the research which i i do myself which i briefly mentioned which is that um when you've got active lupus everything's abnormal in your blood you know the whole thing's chaos and it's really hard to work out what came first uh it's a bit like uh, sometimes the analogy I use is that if you imagine if you were in, in one of those films where you walk into a, a bar and everyone's fighting and there's like a huge fight and everyone's fighting with everyone else, you don't know who started it. And, it <laughs> and actually the person who's being most violent might not have started it. Yeah. Uh, so just the thing that's highest, most abnormal might not be the start. You, the only way to know who started it is to be there at the start. And and so telling a different story. I try and get at that <laughs> question with these pre-lupus patients, people who haven't got lupus yet, but we follow them, to try and see what order things happen to, because then you can say that comes first, then comes that, then comes that, then, and then you know. But as you say, you might also be able to have that situation after a treatment like this, if you reset the immune system, put it all back to normal, even if it does come back, you can watch how it happens, can't you? And you can well, see I'm guessing, like, this from... came back. First it was A, then it was B, then it was C. Then it was C. So, yeah, yeah, because of the sort of, I mean, hopefully it will be successful, but if it isn't, 
then it's like, okay, maybe that identifies why. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's really interesting. Like you might see it was that those particular B cells that caused the problem and those ones didn't, or it was the interferon that turned on the B cells or something like that. You know, you you can you could be able to watch it happen. That's yeah. really, yeah, that's fascinating. I just realised there's, there's lots more coming from the chat, but I really should ask Zoe if there's anything coming from Facebook just to engage with uh, Facebook if she's there. Yes, of course. Uh, we've got two questions from Facebook at the moment. One okay. is, um, Dr. Vital said this medicine is safe, but how big is the chance of CRS? And this is from Manon on Facebook. Oh, so this please. is, yes, this is a good, it's a very good point, yes. So, um Yes, so I, the, the safety I was talking about was that I gen, as a general rule, I think that drugs that target B cells have a good safety record. That's from medicines, like the, all the different medicines I talked about. CAR-T, we have less information because we have a handful of people. What you really want is like 100 people on CAR-T therapy, 100 people on placebo, so you can compare the safety between them. So the data is limited. As the, the person who asked the question correctly said, there's a thing called CRS, which is cytokine release syndrome. So when you do something big to the immune system like that, you can activate lots and lots of cells and you get these substances in the blood called cytokines. It's a bit like having fever or a sepsis. Um, and so you can be quite ill with that. Um, and they... They have experience of how to treat it because of they've been new, even though it's new in lupus, it's not new in cancer. So they they have experience of how to treat it. So far, the ones they've seen in lupus, it's occurred quite often, but they say they've been able to treat it okay. It's not it's not got to be anything really serious yet. But it is, you you're quite right. I, you know, I I I said that B cell targeting B cells is generally okay been good track record in lupus but it's something we need to very carefully watch with this treatment is how severe could some people get a more severe crs cytokine release syndrome we have to wait and see thank you that's very clear and then uh, linked to that really another person on facebook guarav is asking are there any side effects of this therapy um and they're saying concerns have been raised on twitter among physicians about some possible side effects um, where do you stand on that? Again, I think, um, I think this includes uh, cancer because uh, some of you yes. know that, yes, the FDI, the US Food and Drug Administration, issued an alert about this. And it would be good to know your thoughts about it. Yes. So some of the safety data, so the, most of the experience from CAR T therapy comes from people who did have cancer. Uh, and so what does all of that apply to somebody with lupus? We don't know. And also, the like I always say, is you have to balance the risk of the drug with the risk or, or a treatment with the risk of not having the treatment. Mm. And again, if you've got severe lupus, the risks of not having a good treatment can be. So it, it, there's, there's no world in which it's just drug or, or be perfectly normal and healthy, is there? The, your choice is having active lupus, probably quite bad lupus, or having the risks of the treatment. And that's why sometimes the balance can come out in faith, even if the treatment does have some side effects, it can still be safer than not. Um, so we need more evidence to show that. You are, of course, having the cyclophosphamide and the fludarabine as well, which can do other things. Um, so I think people are correct to have some concerns to say i want to we want to see the safety of this um we have to see it not in people with cancer we want to see it in people with lupus and we want to see it in more than five people or ten people we want hundreds who are followed properly in a trial i think it's completely correct to say we we, we don't know when we do these trials what normally happens because you know these trials can take years and while the trials are in progress, sometimes you don't even know who's had what treatment because they try and disguise it. So you don't know if you're on the real treatment or not. But when we do these trials, what they usually do is have something called a drug safety monitoring board. So I've done this before for a drug called Voxosporin that came out. And what we were doing is even though the trial, no one, you know, no one's seen the result, there's a board of people who get to look at the data every few months as the trial goes on. And so if, say, someone gets a serious reaction or some complication or say something 
like they developed cancer or they developed a strange infection or something like that. There's a board of people who can look and see which drug they were on. And if we start to see a signal, oh, look, we're seeing we've got three cases on this treatment and none on the placebo, and that's a bit suspicious, then it goes four or five and we start getting worried, then the trial gets stopped. So um, that's how, that's how, yeah. So the evidence isn't there. The evidence will be there when they do big trials. And that's how we watch for it in case something unusual is happening. I yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. That's it's reassuring. <laughs> um, I think it's like, like you said, it's when Jeanette's just commented too, it's the risk benefit kind of ratio, isn't it? And it's, it's hard it's to make. But... And also what other treatments could you have? Yeah. And what have you tried and what uh, options yeah, have you have left Is there nothing left, well? left for you? Or... Well, yeah. Like you're saying about your patient, you know, when you've yeah. gone through so many All these things. Years. Yeah. yeah and you're hoping the next one will work but you don't know yeah. but you take that risk to get that benefit i also i'll just jump in and say i've seen somebody else ask the question is it safe yeah. for autologous stem cell therapy and i think the answer to that is yes okay went a year a long time again this is tw more than 20 years ago but people had the same idea that if you wiped out the immune system completely you could build it back again and what they were doing with that stem cell therapy was really wiping up everything not just your b cells everything b cells t cells all your uh, and you you at that point your risk of infection was so high you had to be locked into an enclosed room with filtered air and things because your risk of infection was so high but and and that it's safer than that yeah i think that might be a crossover question someone asked earlier um do you have to stay in intensive care after the infusion but that is more the stem cell related or yeah because it, it's not it, as uh wiped out in the lupus correct. protocol yes what they used to do with the stem cell thing was you'd be in this kind of sealed room that had double doors like an airlock and filter oh, wow. there um, and anyone who was coming in like nurses and things would have to have all this protective gear and stuff to stop you getting an infection but that yeah. that was stem cell transplant yeah thank you for clarifying that because yeah, i think it's you can associate that as the the same yeah um Someone else, Jeanette was asking, what about people with a lot of damage after many years of SLE? They won't get rid of those after the reset, right? Question yeah, mark. exactly right. Yeah. Um, and this is, unfortunately, what happens sometimes with lupus is that, so at the start, I have to find with patients is they start to get more frustrated that the treatments don't seem to work very well after a long, because when you first have lupus, everything's caused by active inflammation and active inflammation with if you get the right treatment can be undone and you go and it's the effect seems magical you're like all those problems have all got better because i took treatment. but sometimes if you've had it for many years and it hasn't been treated very well now you've got some organs that are damaged you've got some side effects of steroids you've got like i say i, I just think sometimes the fact that it changes your life actually mm -hmm. that you have to become used to being an ill person who depends on other people maybe not working anymore things like that and you start to have some problems that aren't due to active inflammation the drugs aren't these treatments aren't going to have the same magical effect that they had the first time you took them so it is correct but this is this is an argument just to get the best treatments early yeah, yeah. i was just thinking that then you hope that when these become more prolific that on diagnosis or within the first year two years whatever it might be but yeah, you so don't have to do that trial and error about, for years upon years upon years. So when we talk about lupus treatments at conferences now, we're saying, does this treatment work or not? Yes. But in the next, in a few years time, we should not be saying like, does it work or not? We say we've got loads of treatments that work. The question is what order do you use them in and who gets it? And that kind of, and then you get into more ambitious things, don't you? So even, even if treatments don't cure lupus, like you haven't got it anymore, you can still make better use of them. Uh, yeah. We can see the landscape is increasing, you know, rapidly already. Yeah. And then hopefully that will influence newer patients. Yeah. Um, a lot of people were asking about age. Uh, did Is there an effect on sort of when your age and if you're treated with this? Theoretically, I don't see why there should be. Okay. That's um, good. More theory. to do with the severity of your disease. Yeah. I mean, the risks of treatments can become higher in older people because they have more risks of lots of problems or infections and things. Um, and younger people can get different risks um, because they're still growing. 
Um, but you remember we said that each case is you've got to balance it for your situation. I mean, it could be worth it for anyone, mm. any of those treatments. So yeah, I don't I don't imagine I don't think most things should be it shouldn't be age the number that makes the decision. It should be the entire situation. Oh, that's yeah, sorry, I've just started to get distracted by another question there. But um you know what they're coming in hard and fast, but we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um I I think maybe I'll ask. I mean, if you looking at the chat, there was there was a couple of specific questions about people's certain um, conditions. Like I think one of our uh, one of the patients actually had lymphoma, which she was treated for, um, and she was asking, would that mean that she'd be less likely to get lymphoma again, um, because of being treated with rituximab? I don't know if that's I would think so. Niche. Yeah, because that gives you somewhat protection from it. If it was a B, if it was a lymphoma of B cells, which it usually is that's the most common type of lymphoma then obviously treating targeting b cells would be good you know oh that's, really, that's good to know um and then another person who Anne marie who uh, she said i just got diagnosed with um ms mycosis you did i can't say the last one you probably know this um you go mycosis fungoides thank you very much uh, uh yes yeah it probably caused by too much t cells you're saying well be... it's caused because your immune system isn't yeah. Yes. Exactly. So yes, it, it's it's a uh, that that is caused by too much T cells um, and T cells that are overgrowing. Um, so uh, the um, you, you have to have drug. Uh, this is that well outside my area. I have to say. Oh, sorry. Is it a bit too? <laughs> you're, you're trying to target a different cell because CAR T, although it's made from T cells, is not targeting T cells. It's targeting. I see. Sorry, so it's, um, so yeah, sorry. Want, it's almost like you just want the opposite kind of thing. You even target T cells. Instead. Well, I appreciate you uh, um, yeah. still giving us your knowledge on that one. Um, we've got one more from Marta. Um, we develop a prolific protocol with hematologists. Uh, all lymphoma patients infused with CAR T stay in ICU for at least forty-eight hours to monitor symptoms. I wonder if you think about doing the same in your centres for SLE patients. Yes, I mean, I mean, I think the thing is, isn't it, is that mo most people, some people will get serious. You, 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 like, like we've said a few times, you can. There are some serious complications, this cytokine release syndrome and storm and things around the time of receiving the CAR T therapy. But not everyone, will, and some some people will need some treatment for that. Not everyone will need it at all. So it's really it's about being close to those facilities should they be needed. Okay, so you have them ready to go, um, yeah, but hopefully so, you don't have to. You know, I, I, intensive care is just a ward at the end of the day, but it's a ward that can do things like put people on a ventilator or put people on lots and lots of infusions or very in close monitoring, and you've got your own nurse that's watching you 100% of the time. But you can be on intensive care without having all that stuff you, know, you, you it, it doesn't you, have to be in that setting not everyone on intensive care is getting the full package of everything so you, you could be there so they're hovering over you but not necessarily needing everything here yeah. it was a bit like that with covid you know when it started you remember there were lots of you know they they didn't necessarily ventilate everyone but you needed someone with a ventilator nearby in case you need it's a bit like that you know like yeah having, as long as you're sort of ventilator ventilator adjacent in exactly Exactly. You're fine. Yeah. Um, I was actually going to ask one question that I, one thing that came about for me when you were talking about the CAR T cell therapy and then the role of interferons within lupus. Could it be that I mean, I guess this is depending on how the CAR T therapy progresses, but could you do a sort of dual treatment with interferon? Maybe. Um, yeah. two two pronged approach. Yeah, that may be some people need that. Yeah. They, so again, these are these are all this is these this is all again going back to the sort of like once we've got drugs that work we yeah. can think of clever ways to use them but it, i think there's some people where that would totally make sense yeah i've seen people before where one drug sorted out one part of their lupus but the other one got worse and then we switched them onto another drug and that kind of and they end up sort mm. of switching backwards and forwards between things to get you know for what's and it, it yeah it's a complicated disease I am. Um, I was going to say, I'll, I'll I'll stop asking you lots of questions now. But thank you so much because it really does. It shows that you're, you know, you're you're 
it's amazing all the different um, options that we'll have and all the different manifestations are starting to have answers to them and thinking of it as the the larger picture of lupus rather than just a you know like so that everybody hopefully will have an answer to their specific manifestation and i think the other thing yeah exactly so i think I, what i i perhaps I, I, I was planning to say but i've sort of forgotten until now is i've told you about this car t therapy and i've told you about some of the b cell monoclonal antibodies and the interferon therapies there are so many other drugs that do so many different things and they are lots of them are looking exciting in trials so although there's you know there's a lot of excitement about car t it's quite possible that some of those other medicines will be the ones that really make the revolution some of those have tr evidence in like 200 people uh, not five or ten um and so uh, if i i wouldn't if i was betting I might put money on this car T therapy, <laughs> but I wouldn't put all my money on it. I'd be putting some well, of just my a little money bit on each money. one, and then hopefully you'll make a your millions out of it all. Yes, um, so they, and they, so uh, they're, they're, it, although it seems interesting and different, it's it, the we, the other 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 drugs that are in development could be better. Um, and I guess it's, it's having all those elements, isn't it? It's having all those drugs in development so that you've got one answer, someone else has got another answer, and then hopefully we, yeah. you know, keep multiplying. Yeah, all answers. this activity is good, yeah. Yeah, anyway, I should pass back to Delilah to uh, to finish because we are, we've just gone over, hasn't we? Sorry for keeping you an extra couple of minutes. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. That was wonderful. Um, one more question, because this is important. And you got an update recently from the American College of Rheumatology Congress is about vac vaccines and CAR-T therapies. Um, oh, that yeah. will probably be the same as it is with rituximab and drugs like that, which is that while you've got no B cells, vaccines won't really work. They might work a bit. They can still work a bit, but they won't work as well. So if you have a vaccine first, you're immune, then you have no B cells. That's OK. But if you have get rid of your B cells and try taking vaccines, they won't do you any harm. They just won't work very well. They won't protect you. It's not nothing, to be fair. We checked it uh, for rituximab and it, it's still they still help a bit, but they don't give you a full protection until your B cells come back. So you've got this period where vaccines won't work. Yeah. That's Thank you, Dr. Ed. Uh, as uh, Janet just said, the future is looking promising for lupus patients. Yes, indeed. Uh, yep. Yes, it is. All yeah. right. So we will send an evaluation uh, to everyone who attended this. Please fill in uh, the form so we can get your feedback. Thank you, Dr. Ed, for a wonderful evening. Uh, I think we, we ended up wiser and better informed patients that are, know what they're doing and understand the um, what this therapy and treatments are. This is great, really great. Uh, we look forward to a next webinar in the future. Please uh, stay in touch. Yeah. Okay, then, thanks. thanks. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending.